Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Ability to Use webinar training on tips for planning an accessible meeting. Again, um, my name is Rosemary Ponsalon, the program coordinator at the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers uh, for the Ability to Use program. My colleague, Samantha, is here as well, and uh, she will be co-presenting co with me. Uh, Samantha, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay as well? Okay, great. Um, I'm the Office and Logistics Coordinator with California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and I'm really pleased to be here with you guys today. We have a good size group here on this webinar training, and before we begin with the presentation, we have a couple of questions for, for you all. And as Nibion mentioned earlier uh, when she was reviewing the, the webinar logistics, uh, if you can use the polling feature, which is at the top right of your um, participants list, it's the polling feature. So for the question, if, it, if your answer to the question is no, uh, choose and select X. If it's a yes, uh, choose and select the, the check mark. So the question is, how many of you are new to planning an accessible event? I have the polling results on the whiteboard, and it looks like we have one uh, that is new to planning an accessible event, uh, which is 2%, and then 17% um, for yes and then 27, uh, no response. The second question is, have you been tasked to plan an event? Um, an event could be a small event, such as a meeting. Uh, a large event could be a conference uh, or a workshop, a fundraising event. 3% no and 90% yes. OK. Great, uh, thank you. That that gives us an idea. Um, much appreciated for your responses. So moving on to the next slide, uh, we have a lot to cover within an hour. And um, again, as uh, Nubion mentioned, if you have any general questions throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to enter your questions in the chat box as we go along. Um, for any specific questions, we'll tackle them at the, at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so uh, we'll do our best. We just wanted to make sure that we provide as much of the information as we can uh, within an hour, because we have a lot to cover. And uh, so we just want to make sure. So um, this webinar training is an overview. Uh, Samantha and I, what we did is um, we prepared this PowerPoint presentation based on our based on our experience. Um, of course, our, as our daily uh, responsibility or task, we were uh, we need to schedule um, small events or uh, big events like resource events. Um, and what we've learned during the planning process. Um, there, the, what we've learned is the planning and asking early of the right questions is so important for the planning process. Um, so what we'll do today is we will talk about the common barriers for people with all disabilities. Uh, we'll provide you a checklist of the five important tasks that we came up with. and. Um, the, the tips and tools and tricks for each of the tasks uh, that will make your future meeting accessible to people with disabilities. And of, the, and of course, at the very end of the, the presentation, um, we provided some uh, valuable resources to go to or use as a reference. This is Samantha. Um, during the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing ways to make your meetings equal and accessible for everyone. Um, and we thought it was important to understand some of the common barriers that people with disabilities encounter when attending an event, you know, such as yours, um, and so that you're better equipped to face those barriers. Um, so physical barriers, such as ones that someone who uses a wheelchair or who's blind perhaps might encounter, such as sidewalks with no curb cuts or stairs with no ramps. 
um, furniture, spaced, and accessibly. Um, these are things we're going to discuss shortly, um, but it's so you can ensure your guests have physical access to your meeting. Transportation can be difficult for someone who is unable to drive for various reasons. So you'll need to keep that um, in mind that some of your guests will be reliant on public or alternative transportation modes, and they're subject to the schedules of those modes of transportation. Um, communication barriers can be bridged with assistive technology devices or through accommodations, such as having someone caption a meeting um, like we are today, or having ASL interpreters at your meeting. And technology barriers um, can prevent someone from interacting you know, in a webinar such as this one. So you'll need to think about alternative methods for people to participate in your meetings or events. Um, the teleconference bridge is, that we're using today is an example of this. Um, and then we have a little note here which um, I think above all is really important to remember when you're planning your meetings. It's that people are experts on their own lives and disabilities. So if you have a question about what would work best for one of your guests, don't make any assumptions and just ask them. They'll know what works best for them. Um, okay, so um, this is our sort of agenda for the day. Um, this is sort of the meat of everything. We're going to be talking about how to select your venue, um, planning considerations, registration for your meeting, preparing presenters, and um, what to do at your meeting to, uh, to make it equal and accessible for everyone. Um, so Rosemary is going to go over some tips for uh, selecting your venue. Thank you, Samantha. So um, before you choose a location of your, your, of your event, um, you want to prepare a list of your, your specifications and your access questions when you, when you contact the, the site location. Um, so having the list in front of you or preparing it for, you know, for future is to, it'll help you to um, locate um, an accessible location that will meet your, your needs. So the questions to ask yourself is, is your event, um, is it an indoor or an outdoor event? Um, and it, how, when uh, when do you want to have the event, or ha and or how long is the event? So you want to plan yourself ahead of time um, when you're um, you know cho choosing a location, and then also the the nature of the event. Um, is it an in person? Um, is it an outreach or resource event? So once you once you noted down some of uh, the possible uh, available dates um, and some locations that you want to look into, um, the, the 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 next of this task um, is selecting your your venue, uh, it, which is very crucial because this is where the you know, this is where everybody comes in to um, to attend and participate. So uh, it, it's recommended that you visit the the site location ahead of time, if possible. Uh, that way, you can evaluate or um, conduct any um, you know, if there's any um, building access issues. Um, the building access issues include. Uh, not only the the outside, the surroundings of the the building, but um, the lobby and the the meeting rooms. Um, if for some reason you're not able to visit the, the site location, uh, of course you you can contact the the site coordinator uh, via email or phone. Um, what I like to do is I like to send an introduction email to the coordinator and just let the, let him or her know that um, you know we are looking for a um, a site to uh, or an organization to host our event, um, a person or um, event, and uh, we wanted to find out if you guys will be you know, interested, um, but do you want to ask um, some building access questions uh, such as, you want to make sure um, 
year, the building is barrier free. Um, are the the doorways wide enough for a person who's, uh, who is, is uses a mobility aid, such as a wheelchair, a scooter, walker, or a cane, or um, a service animal? So for the entrance, you want to know uh, if it's wide enough to get in through the entrance. Are are there ramps available? Uh, not only just the, the stairs or steps, but are, are there ramps available? The the signage um, is signage um, visible or it large enough to see signs where it'll direct the the attendees and participants to to uh, inside of the the building or to the parking area or uh, public um, transportation area. The the pathway to the meeting um, is it. Um, accessible uh, to get to the meeting room um, is a barrier free meeting um, there's no other large uh, objects in the way um, are the bathrooms accessible um, is there um, a designated area or an outdoor area for service animals uh, the, the, the still the eating areas uh, you also want to check into um, the the restaurants and eating facilities if they're accessible. And then, um, of course, the integrated seating, which I'll talk into more in details in the next um, slide. And then the outdoor meeting considerations. Um, this is important to look into also if you are, if your event's going to be an outdoor uh, event, you want to make sure that it's, um, you know, barrier free, is the signage visible, are there nearby uh, accessible bathrooms or potties. Um, so this is um, some of the the, the, the access um, to, uh, thing, items to go into to consider. The meeting room is where the attendees will spend majority of their time. Um, and it's a way, of, you know, it's a way to network and expand your organization's mission. Uh, so it's important that the meeting room is accessible to all attendees. Um, when it comes to requesting a meeting space, um, for example, if you have a large group size, uh, like 100 people or more, uh, what I like to, I have a time frame um, to, uh, make the request. So again, 100 people or more request the space 12 months in advance. Um, if it's 50 to 99 people, which is about a medium-sized group, um, I like to make sure that I make the request six months in advance. Um, if it's a small group size, uh, less than 50 people uh, request the space three months in advance. Um, Want to make sure that you have a an area or a table for registration or check-in. Um, this is where you welcome the attendees um, in case if, it, if, it, if attendees have any questions like where, uh, where is the meeting room or where can I go to the restroom or where, where can I go um, outside um, for my service animal. So this is kind of like the, the main um, to go to for the registration to check in. Um, some of the, the questions you want to ask, excuse me, some of the questions you want to ask about the meeting room access is, is the meeting room space large enough to accommodate groups and equipment? You want to think about um, uh, folks who um, use mobility aids, uh, like as um, Samantha mentioned earlier for the common barriers for physical, uh, such as the wheelchair, scooters, um, the walker, cane, and equipment. So there may be some meeting, meeting rooms that have large equipment, such as having um, a rolling cart with a, a TV or uh, any other um, audiovisual equipment. Uh, so you want to have a, a meeting with that spacious enough to maneuver around. 
um, is the seating area wide enough for pathway travel? So for example, I have two um, screen um, or two images on the this slide, the accessible and meeting room slide, and uh, the there's one um, image that shows two uh, two rows of three tables, and there's like two chairs on each table, so it's enough space to accommodate, not accommodate, I'm sorry, to have space for um, someone uh, that uses a mobility aid. Um, and then also, at the, the second image below is a U-shaped table. Um, you'll notice that there's lots of chairs around the, the U-table, um, so it's not, um, so you want to make sure that there's room. Um, you don't want to have, you don't want to put someone uh, with the, you know, um, wheelchair the outside next to the, the entrance. You want to make them part. Um, so you want everybody to feel included for the present or for the meeting part. You want to ask about the telephone with the speaker. There's some attendees that may not be able or, or not may not be able to join or participate at uh, the in-person event. So having a telephone uh, with a speaker uh, is important. You want to also ask about the nearby accessible rooms, um, accessible restrooms. And then in case in, in the event, um, sometimes I've run into this, uh, but um, I always like to ask the person um, coordinated is, in case if I have any technical support or if I need to uh, adjust the room thermostat or the lighting, uh, who can I contact? Other meeting room uh, to um, consider uh, for setup uh, is, as I mentioned, the, the lighting. Uh, some people may be sensitive to light if they're like, uh, you know, especially if they're close to a, a nearby window with natural light. Um, does the window have, um, what do you call those, um, those um, adjustable blinds that you can close? Um, electrical wiring, uh, that's also important to, to note. Uh, you want to make sure that they're securely taped on the floor, or if tape's not available, usually uh, they have a covered, it's a cover, like a long piece of cover that um, will cover the any uh, cables or wiring. Uh, this is to prevent any um, hazard or falling or tripping over. OK, um, so if you're having a multi-day meeting or you think that your guests may need to travel to the meeting the night before, you'll probably need to work with a hotel for a guest room block. Um, and in some cases, this may be the same location as your meeting. And if so, when you're doing your site visit, um, as Rosemary mentioned, you can do this then. Or maybe it's just nearby. So we do also recommend that if you're going to be um, getting a hotel room block, if you're able to, a site visit is always a great way to um, make sure that you can see for yourself what each room is like. Um, so a couple of recommendations, just as with the accessibility of the building, you want to make sure that all public areas in the hotel are barrier free, that somebody who uses a mobility aid or an assistive animal can get through and easily access the space. Um, my very first question to a hotel is always how many ADA accessible rooms they have. And these are rooms that meet the standards of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so that means the space should be barrier free, um, that, there's, that there's room for somebody to get by between the bed and any other pieces of furniture. Um, typically, they'll have longer tabs on the curtains for somebody who uses a wheelchair or is of short stature. There will be space under the bathroom sink for someone who uses a wheelchair so that they can roll up to it. Um, You'll also want to ask how many of the ADA rooms have roll-in showers. So there's a standard ADA room, which typically has a detachable handheld shower head and a shower chair. So that's for people who may transfer from, say, their wheelchair to the shower chair. And then a roll-in shower has a tub and allows somebody who stays in their wheelchair to roll into the shower. And you'll want to ask your guests if they require an ADA room, um, and if so, if they need a roll-in shower or a standard um, bathroom. 
Um, so again, a site visit. Um, there are standards for ADA rooms, for instance, but hotel staff typically doesn't completely understand the needs of somebody with a disability. Um, so it's always best to check these things out for yourself, and it's also a good time to inform the hotel staff of the needs of people with disabilities. It always helps your guests, but also future guests. Um, elevators, they should ding or announce the floors as they pass by so that somebody who's blind can track or otherwise know which floor they're at. Um, we encountered something at one of the meetings that we did where guests were required to swipe their room key card in the elevator before it would even move. And so this was really inaccessible to our guests who are blind, of short stature, who used mobility aids. Um, so you'll want to make sure that all your guests are able to move throughout the hotel as independently as possible. Um, again, entrance doors should have ramps. There shouldn't be a separate entrance for people um, who need you know, ramps or any other um, accessible features. Um, we just want to make sure it's easy for your guests to all equally get into the hotel. Um, as Rosemary mentioned, signage should um, be clear and in a large enough print that people who have low vision will be able to locate necessary hotel amenities. Um, it's also helpful for um, room doors to have braille on them so that somebody can identify their own room. Um, uh, let's see, public restrooms at the hotel should have an accessible stall, There's plenty of space next to the toilet for people who transfer. Um, the counter should have space underneath for those who use wheelchairs to roll under. And it's harder to find. I actually haven't found this very many places, but if you do find it, this is a great sign. Um, a door opening button is always a plus because those doors tend to be really heavy anyway for anybody, but it can be especially difficult for somebody to open who doesn't have you know, full use of their hands or arms or who are seated in mobility devices. Um, public Seating areas should be barrier free, have easily integrated seating. Um, as Rosemary mentioned, um, we want to make sure that all of your guests can sit wherever they like. Um, and so you want to make sure that there's not big, heavy furniture that you know somebody who, uh, let's say, uses a wheelchair, they want to sit next to somebody. We want to make sure it's easy to move chairs or that there are already chairs removed so that it's easy for them to um, to get around. Um, and so you can even ask the hotel ahead of time if they can better accommodate your group. And I mean, again, also future guests who might have disabilities by better integrating their seating. And again, it's just another opportunity to talk to the hotel about making it accessible for everybody. Um, just a quick a few other things to consider. It's um, whether there's a fixed lift at the pool, if the hotel has one. Um, these are bolted to the ground instead of things that come out you know, just when they're requested. Um, and this just sort of shows that the hotel is committed to making the hotel accessible. Um, this is probably isn't likely you know, essential to your meeting or your guests, but it's something to consider and just sort of makes sure that your you know, meeting attendants are able to have an equal experience at the hotel. Um, and also, if they're not already in the, in the room, um, ask if uh, the hotel is able to place refrigerators in your room at, in a room at request. Some guests may have medication that they're required to refrigerate, and um, it, it, it has come up many times when I'm planning meetings. Um, and that's something that when you're looking for a hotel, if you're, if you're going to be either for your event or for your guests to stay for your event, um, something to consider. Um, also, when you're selecting your venue, you're going to want to keep in uh, in your mind um, that some of your guests may be reliant on public transportation. Um, and you also just want to think about other ways that transportation may affect your venue when you're deciding where you want to, um, to set up. So um, if your guests are going to be using public transportation, you have to think about how close that is, how close is the local bus station um, or bus stop or train station, um, and will they still have to get from you know, from the bus stop or train station to the facility, so make sure that distance is short. Um, you're going to want to check the number of accessible parking spots at the location and make sure they're truly accessible, that they're near a curb cut um, and well marked so that, um, you know, you have plenty of space for your, your guests who have disabilities to park. Um, if your meeting is going to be in a different place than, let's say, the hotel, if you are having that multi-day meeting, um, you will have to think about how your guests are going to get from one place to the other. And not all of your guests may have a car with them. So if you're considering doing something like providing transportation between two locations, or let's say you're going off-site to the, make a visit to, to some other location, you'll just want to make sure you have an accessible option and that it's available throughout the day. There are going to be 
some guests who might, for a health reason, have to go back to the hotel or to another, you know, to the other location. Um, and so you'll want to make sure that you have um, that available so guests um, are able to come and go as you please. Um, if your attendees are going to be flying or taking the train, you'll want to look at the closest airport and train station. Um, this came up recently at a meeting that we planned, um, and flights were, weren't as common. They didn't leave as, as often as some other um, airports. And so you want to make sure that flights arrive and leave often enough that your guests, um, you know, if it's a one-day meeting, that they can get there in the morning um, for your meeting, um, that, you know, that it's um, not going to be difficult for people to get to and from the airport. So sometimes hotels or other locations will provide a shuttle to and from the airport. If so, um, you need to know that they are required to have an accessible option if they provide an option, you know, a complimentary option to everyone else. So you can gently but firmly uh, remind your contact as you're working with a venue about this. And if they don't already have an accessible shuttle and they're providing a complimentary shuttle to everyone else, then you can give them, you know, you can help by giving them a local accessible cab option, and then they can work directly with them or the guests to reimburse or otherwise pay for this because they are required to um, provide equal accommodations for everyone. Um, likewise, make sure that local airport shuttles, such as, such as you know, Super Shuttle or something, um, have accessible options in your area. So you can also make sure to provide your guests with that information when you do registration. But um, you know, find out, do that, would they need to call ahead? Is one available at any time? Um, so these are just some extra things to consider while you're deciding on your venue for your event. Um, do I have any questions at this time? Um, but feel free to, to, to pop in if you do. Um, we're going to move on to planning considerations. So once you've secured your venue, you need to start thinking about some other things. You'll probably still be working on maybe a contract or you know, just some other details with your site, um, the site facilitator um, or you know, hotel contact, things like that. So when you're thinking about your um, meeting start time and end time, um, we want you to consider the following. First, of course, like I just mentioned, public transportation availability. How easily will somebody taking the local bus be able to get there by 7 or 8 AM? How far do they have to travel once they're off the bus? Things like that. Um, you'll also want to include a little extra time for people who use a personal attendant or who have a longer morning routine. Um, we typically start our meetings a little bit later than usual, especially on the first day of a multi-day meeting. That way, people who are flying in that morning um, you know, can get over to the, the meeting location um, or who, people who you know, may have arrived the night before or who arrived that morning if they have a, a, a longer morning routine because of health um, or other needs. Um, and also, if you have a long day, we encourage you to include breaks in your agenda um, and, and that you have long enough breaks. You want to make sure that people who need to take medication or who may need a personal attendant to use the restroom or you know, anything else have a long enough break so they're fully able to participate in your meeting and they don't have to take time away from the meeting to participate. Um, also, if you are going to be providing food and beverage at your meeting, you'll need to work with a facility or a catering company to make sure you have an accessible meal. And we'll go into some of the details of actually doing, you know, uh, providing the food and beverage later. But just while you're working on your planning, while you're deciding if you're going to have food and beverage and how, you know, how you're going to work with companies to do that, um, you will need to consider whether a plated meal or a buffet will work best. Um, we have in the past done a lot of buffet meals, but we recently sort of polled some of our uh, attendees and, and found that it's most accessible to serve a plated meal because each guest you know, has their plate brought to them. There aren't as many options to consider or discuss with people. Um, but we've done a lot of buffets as well. And so you'll just, you, that's, you know, you just need to take into account that you'll need um, a staff member or you know, hotel staff or catering staff um, there. And I'll go over that a little bit later also. But just know that you'll, you'll want to count on having you know, maybe one of your staff members just set aside there, let them know I'm going to need you during food and beverage time. Um, or let the facility know or caterers know, um, you know that you'll want somebody there in case somebody needs assistance getting their plate to their seat or um, 
you know, plating their meal itself. Um, you also want to let the know, let the facility or caterers know um, that you want all the food placed at the same level and close to the edges of the table um, so that everyone can reach and see, see the meal options. Um, of course, we're going to keep talking about integrated and wheelchair accessible seating because it's really important to make sure that your um, attendees have equal and um, accessible access to everything. Um, and then lastly, something that just sort of occurred to me, uh, you'll want to ask your guests who use a personal attendant, and that might come up during registration, but um, if they would like to have lunch provided for the personal assistant. So if you're, if you're paying for, or if they're paying for the meal, you'll want to have an option so that they can indicate that their personal assistant would, you know, like to participate in lunch. But either way, you'll want to make sure you count the personal assistant in your seating um, for lunch or dinner or breakfast um, because they will need to assist your guests with their meal. Um, it's just another thing to consider. Um, so, do we have any questions I have a about? Question on the phone. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, this is Mike Levinson. Um, just may be not able to see from the webinar because I'm on teleconference. But one thing that comes up at meetings that I have uh, is both when there's large people in the room where the meeting is, or large people on the phone. Uh, having a handheld mic uh, sometimes works very well if the room doesn't have like a microphone in front of everybody's seat. The people on the phone frequently have trouble hearing and occasionally there Absolutely. are people with Thank you, Mike. hearing disabilities in the room. Yeah, and exactly. And um, we'll go over well. some AV stuff later as well, but that's absolutely true. That's one of the ways that you can make sure you're, that everyone um, has equal communication you know, access to the meeting that they can hear, um, and we'll go over that a little bit later too. We also, Sharon um, said in the chat box that they provide armless chairs for large people who do not fit into regular sized chairs, um, and if they're the kind that have tables attached, they provide a separate small table for the person. Um, that's also useful. We have a couple of, um, I have a couple of people who come to our meetings who um, that's the most comfortable way for them to um, to, to use a chair as they lean on it and they um, need armless chairs as well. So definitely, uh, you know, sort of like I said in the beginning, the most important thing is talking to your attendees and finding out what works best for them because they'll know best and then having a variety of options so that you can, you know, make sure that you have everything that you need for guests. Um, so thank you, Michael and Sharon. Um, we'll go over some tips for registration now that you've got your venue, you've secured everything with caterers and you know, all, of, all of those people. Um, something that we always include in our registration is information on a scent-free environment. In our office, actually, we're working on making our, our, off, our entire office, including our, um, our meetings, scent-free. And this is because some guests or people in the meeting um, may have chemical sensitivities, but also it's just good practice to have scent-free meetings for healthy indoor air quality, and that's for everybody. So you can do that by informing guests prior to the meeting that you will have a scent-free environment and that they should refrain from using scented perfumes, deodorant, soaps, detergents, etc. Um, you can repeat this information everywhere you can, on your registration, in your email signature, in meeting materials, outreach, make an announcement during the meeting just to remind people. Again, this is just so that um, you know, people who do have this chemical sensitiv sensitivities are comfortable and safe in the, in the meeting space, but also just for everyone to have um, healthy space. Find out you know, maybe from the facility if you're able to open a window. That's always good to get fresh air. And also ask them if they're going to have new carpeting or other materials in the space, if they'll be under construction um, because those things off gas and that's um, a, a main uh, contributor to unhealthy indoor air quality. Um, and ask if they can refrain from using heavy chemical cleaners prior to your arrival. Um, if they don't have a scent-free soap in their bathroom, you know, may, you might consider bringing one to the meeting itself. Um, again, just so that um, everyone is comfortable. Okay, next um, for the registration is the, the accommodation request. Um, when you're sending out a, an accessible um, registration form, um, you want to make sure that you include the, the options um, 
um, in your registration in terms of whether it's online or, or a paper registration and then also to include the information on how to make the request and uh, of course you want to note the, the, the deadline um, date to um, reply or um, submit for the request for the accommodation. So examples of the accommodations that you can list um, is the, the American Sign Language or Language Interpreting, the CART, uh, CRT, which stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation, uh, which is used for, for captioning. And then also uh, di any dietary uh, restrictions, um, assistive listening devices, um, the magnifier or ACC TV, and then also a, a note taker or a, a recording device if, if needed. And um, the, the materials for the, your your meetings, um, if it's, uh, any presentation or any um, agenda, um, you want to include the, all, the the listings of the requests, such as Braille, large print, uh, plain text on CDs, use USB device drives or emails, and um, if other languages are needed, um, you want to have these. Uh, the accommodations listed under registration, so that way when you're sending your your registration, it you know in advance uh, and you receive the um, registrations, you'll have an idea of the number of people who made the request for the accommodation, and this gives you time to to plan to um, make any prints if needed. Um, you know, you may do some printing in-house, uh, but if you have a listing of contacts that um, or that are contracted to do your prints, especially the Braille, uh, which um, you know takes time um, to to get the prints uh, to you and delivered to you. So on this slide, I have a sample of a registration form. Uh, that you can um, use as a, a guidance. But on this sample of registration, it has um, the registrant's uh, contact information, uh, the, the lodging, uh, as Samantha mentioned earlier about the hotel accommodations. Um, and then also it has um, the the accommodations such as uh, printed materials, audio taped materials, if the materials need to be recorded um, so that it, someone um, that uses maybe um, that uses a screen reader software to, to hear the, the text um, version of the materials. Um, if you have an interpreter, um, a note taker, reader, uh, large print and etc. So tips for preparing uh, presenters. Um, the alternative formats. Once you um, you know once you've used, you've secured your your speakers or presenters for your your meeting, you want to inform ahead of time your presenters of your requirements for materials and presentations. Um, we, at, we do have a document that um, you know, talks about the guidelines for our in-person presenters. Um, it, it breaks down in sections, for example, handout materials. Um, you want to make sure that the print materials um, are in uh, font size 14 to 16 sans serif. Um, you do not want to use a smaller font because that may be um, difficult to or may not be readable. Um, and then um, so at this slide I have uh, just a couple of images um, for alternative formats. Braille, large print, um, CD or 
uh, just for electronic documents and then uh, the, the language. And sometimes presenters may not um, have the, the knowledge or the basic um, knowledge on how to create um, or how to make their, their documents accessible. So having the, the guidelines, a document of the guidelines provided to them would be helpful. Um, and uh, also, I sometimes I um, refer them to some of the like the how-to resources, like either on YouTube, um, if captions are available, um, or just um, any other uh, accessible related sites that uh, show you how to create accessible documents. So um, accessible presentation and materials. So during your your meeting when when giving a a presentation um, you want to make sure the you know the, the visual aids such as like the, the the charts the pictures or the the PowerPoint presentation itself um, you know make sure you're you're describing um, especially when it comes to any um, images or videos that do not have captions. Um, you know, you want to um, perhaps maybe ask a volunteer, um, you know, someone to either um, describe or the presenter could describe too. But if, if it's like a movie playing, um, perhaps a, a volunteer can sit next to an individual um, um, blind or low vision to to describe what the the graphics or the, the video itself, especially if there's no captions available. And um, the comments made by Doug in the chat box have audience questions repeated before answering so everyone can have uh, or heard the question. Um, that is absolutely correct, um, Doug. So uh, in case if um, you have attendees of asking a question, and um, you know um, you may not be heard, especially if it's in a, a, a room setting where if the presenter is not speaking loud enough, um, and uh, folks may not uh, be able to hear the, the question. So yes, uh, Doug, you want to make sure that the questions are uh, repeated. Um, just to make sure that we, you know, all your attendees um, heard the question. Um, again, um, electronic and printed materials, uh, you want to make sure that they are available. And um, when it comes to having a, an accessible presentation, having a microphone or wireless microphone, two actually, one for the attendees um, to, to use and then one for the presenter to use so that the room can be heard. Um, so, OK, so on this slide, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, we have a, a document of guidelines um, for in-person presenters. And it's broken down into sections. So uh, for example, the first section is the handout materials. It provides um, some tips, um, you know, make sure your document is in uh, font size 14 or 16, um, font style sans serif. Section two is the PowerPoint uh, slash visuals. You want to make sure if you have any images or graphics to um, provide a, a brief description out loud. The color of your, your PowerPoint, uh, make sure that it's um, contrast combination. So for example, black and white. Uh, is best, or blue and yellow will also work. So we've just got a couple of minutes, and we want to make sure you guys get a chance to answer or ask some questions. Um, I know there's been a lot of information all at once. Really quickly, at the meeting, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, we always encourage people to use personal, person first language. That just means put the person before the disability, so you'll talk you know, talk to people with disabilities rather than disabled people. Um, an example is she has autism, not she is autistic. And um, somebody uses a wheelchair, sometimes you'll hear people say somebody is confined to a wheelchair or something like that. Um, and it's 
most appropriate and um, respectful to say that somebody you know, just uses that wheelchair. Um, of course, treat somebody with a disability with the same respect you extend to every other person. The meeting, focus on them, not their disability. Of course, most people you know, intend to treat everyone with the same respect, but may not sure. Be sure of the best ways to make that guest feel they're being treated equally. So just always speak with the guests themselves. If you have a, an attendee who is um, you know, deaf and using an ASL interpreter to communicate with you, look at the person you're speaking with, not their interpreter. Um, and then most people will ask if they need assistance. Don't make any assumptions. You can always ask you know, if somebody would like any assistance and how you can best assist them. Um, but just yeah, don't make any assumptions about whether they will or, um, need any assistance at the meeting. Um, food service accessibility, this is similar to what we talked about when you're making your plans, but just um, at the meeting itself, if you're going to be eating in a different location from where the meeting is at um, and it's you know, down the hall or something, make an announcement about where the meal is held and make that as detailed as possible, you know, exit the doors, turn right, 20 steps, you know, about 20 feet, it's the first door on the left, something like that. Um, again, have a staff member or a hotel staff member or a you know, caterer uh, available to provide assistance and um, you know, provide detailed um, information on what's available. We've got an ice cream salad with tomatoes and there is onions and you know, just sort of give, give a clear picture of what's uh, available if you are assisting somebody with their meal and they're blind or you know, have low vision and it's dark in there or something like that. Um, describe, you know, uh, provide straws. Um, this is so that somebody who doesn't have full use of their hands can drink their drinks. Um, it's just something I always have in my arsenal uh, for meetings. And of course, again, just sort of driving home that integrated and wheelchair accessible seating, just making sure that everyone you know, can sit wherever they would like and it's easy to make that happen. Um, let's see. Uh, really quickly, we'll go over AV and then we will be open for questions. When you're, you're securing your, your venue um, or when you're coordinating with, your, with the coordinator, um, you want to think about some of the audio visuals that you, the, the equipment that you think you'll be using. Um, one of them, of course, is the assistive, the assist, sorry, the assistive listening devices, um, CD, DVD, VCR player, uh, a flat screen LCD, um, internet connection, a laptop computer, an LCD projector, and or screen. Um, Microphone, which I mentioned earlier, one is a wireless um, wireless microphone or handheld, wired handheld, and also translation headsets. Uh, audio conference, uh, which is the bridge connection, which I mentioned um, earlier for the accessibility in the meeting room, um, to have a telephone with a speaker available. And then, of course, video conference. Um, so these, um, the listing of the audiovisual are just examples of equipment that you may uh, request. But um, it is um, the more equipment that you put in the request, the better, uh, just so that you have all the equipment needed prepared ahead of time and ready to go. Of course, um, when you when you, um, or before the start of the meeting, you want to make sure that these, the, the equipment that you requested are working properly. One incident at one of the meetings, uh, the, the, the assistive listening devices were not operable and um, it wasn't working because the batteries were dead. So um, you want to make sure that uh, batteries are, um, are working and if any devices that require batteries, make sure you test them uh, just to make sure that they are working properly. So Samantha and I have gathered some resources that we thought were, uh, you know, valuable. There's a ton of resources out there, but we, we added some good information or good resources here. And one is um, the information of technical assistance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. The second resource is the California Department of Rehab of Rehabilitation's Planning Accessible Public Meetings. Uh, the third uh, resource is the American Bar Association 
toolkit. Two additional resources that we found were valuable. These are actually um, readable Word documents, and it was prepared um, by the Independent Living Resource Center of San Francisco's uh, Accessibility for People with Disabilities. And it provides practical tips um, in Word document, and then also another valuable resource from the ILRC Center of San Francisco's um, is the Accessible Basic Guidelines. Resources are will be available once we send out the the readable format of the PowerPoint presentation. Rosemary, um, Helene just th thanks you for sending everything out. Um, and then Sharon also thanks you. Um, so, but I don't see any questions so far. I'm, I can just put up the um, survey if that's fine. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So um, we hope that you learned something from this webinar. And I know um, it, was, it was a lot of content, but within an hour, uh, it was uh, quick. So uh, we hope that um, you've learned something. And the, the tips and tools and tricks that we provided um, is uh, useful, something that you would use to, uh, to make your future meeting accessible to people with all disabilities. Um, again, if you follow these basic tips or the basic information, uh, you will definitely create opportunities for full participation by all attendees. So uh, thank you. Thank you again. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nubian. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for attending. 